appreciate getting invited to this. Thanks to the Pathways uh, coordinators. And uh, I guess I was into this thing because I worked on the wolf recovery in Yellowstone from the, in the role of an economist. So I'm going to kind of hit the high points on that story with a 30,000 foot flyover and uh, see what we miss at the end here. Um, that first uh, slide, let's see if this goes backwards. Kind of a dismal view of the wolf, sort of the Rasputin take, I guess, or maybe that's how Little Red Riding Hoods are. Uh, that's a Missoula artist that I'm fond of, Monty Dolak. This is a little <coughs> brighter view of it, and that's kind of the dichotomy we see in, in people's attitudes toward wolves. It's uh, got a pretty long history. Um, the, the title I picked for this of uh, Wolves, What Good Are They? I didn't actually make that up. That was off of a sign at an anti-wolf uh, rally in Helena, Montana about 1991. I wish I had a picture of that rally. Um, but it kind of implies that maybe you could look at this from a sort of a utilitarian perspective. What good are they? Uh, um, another sort of casual statement of the question we thought was being posed to us as economists in the wolf recovery, developing an EIS. Uh, is wolf recovery in the public interest? You know, how would you translate that into quantitative models or a research agenda? Or similarly, does wolf recovery make economic sense? So that was, that was really where we were trying to get. Uh, you know, when you look at poli resource policy decisions, I, th I think it's true that you can generally classify the statements that people make from the standpoint of uh, these three criteria. Uh, it's the ethical, you know, you just shouldn't do it, or you should, thou shalt protect something. Um, I'm not going to say anything about that. I know we got some uh, philosophers in the room. Um, another important thing that's often brought up is, is a distributive point of view. Who's gains, who's loses? Uh, is it fair? Uh, should there be compensation? Those kinds of questions. And the, the tool that economists have that, that tend to get brought out in that kind of a setting, and probably it's the most common thing that economists do in, in NEPA type studies, EIS studies, is regional economic analysis. People want to know, is this going to help or hurt our local economy? That's a kind of a typical uh, equity kind of thing. So that's one of the things we did. And I'll, I'll get to some results on that and how we approached it. Um, and then the, the last one is really the stock and trade for economists. Uh, you know, is society as a whole better off? And our usual tool is benefit cost analysis. Now, my background, um, I grew up just off the corner of Yellowstone Park in this uh, remote uh, trailhead into the uh, Ansorki Beartooth. I was a lucky kid, I thought. Um, my dad worked at a remote uh, hydropower that was built in 1914. Um, and, you know, we were surrounded by wilderness. It wasn't officially designated as Absorky Beartooth until about 83, but um, when I got around to doing school, um, I ended up writing a, a PhD thesis on the economic value of wilderness. I was a, should I say, a lone wolf or a black sheep. <laughs> uh, my colleagues were more into monetary theory and microeconomics, and in fact, one of them uh, just finished being head of the Federal Reserve Board. So, you know, I kind of went a different way and uh, thought that if I, you know, I was interested in wilderness economics. The Wilderness Act passed in 64. I got out of high school that year. Um, I thought I'd maybe end up a uh, nice, quiet, obscure life as a professor in Missoula, Montana, where I am. But uh, there was a little bit of a societal change. Uh, while I was in grad school, we got the uh, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, shortly after Environmental Policy Act, uh, then Endangered Species Act, as Mike mentioned, uh, CERCLA, Superfund, and it's turned out that uh, they, they needed people that thought about things like what's the value of wilderness or wildlife or fisheries. So I started out doing benefit cost analysis on dams 
people were still building dams when I was in uh, high school and college. Um, <clears throat> worked on a couple of them on the American, Auburn Dam, Klamath, and Kootenai Falls, the last big waterfall in the Northwest. And so when uh, came around to, to this uh, wolf issue, I was already kind of, I was in mid-career and already been thinking about these things for quite a while. Um, so I'm going to start with kind of a little taxonomy of the kind of economic uses that you might investigate. And I'll kind of have to move along here, but obviously there's direct use, like fishing and hunting. Those methods have been around since the early 50s and into the 60s. Uh, actually, one of my good friends is a longtime uh, professor here, John Loomis, and before him, Dick Walsh. I worked with John beginning in 82 on a bunch of fishing and hunting studies in Montana, wildlife viewing. Uh, there are also inputs to production and consumption. But the, the 900 pound uh, gorilla in the room is this idea of passive use. Um, it's also known as non-use. That was before the marketing people got on it, I guess. Uh, here's some uh, random photo of uh, wildlife viewing in Yellowstone. Um, this is an important publication that came out that kind of changed people's thinking about how you approach these issues of value in wildlife. This is from the National Academy of Sciences panel on ecosystem service valuation. We used to just call it fishing and hunting studies, recreation. Uh, but the important thing here is uh, that people began to recognize that in addition to the obvious observable uh, uses like fishing and hunting on site, there may be something called non-use value or passive use that has to do with uh, biodiversity, cultural heritage, existence, and species prevention. And this whole line of thinking actually started with, with one paper, a very short paper, in the American Economic Review in 1967 by this guy, John Cretilla. He happened to be on my, my thesis committee. I was just lucked out there. But he, you know, economists for centuries have been concerned with scarcity, running out of materials, run out of oil, run out of titanium, whatever. Um, and he showed that technological change has kind of put that concern off a bit. I mean, uh, you know, Bakken formation and all that, it just keeps on going, finding ways to do things, more technology. But that doesn't happen with what we, services we gain from natural environments and wildlife. So he, he brought the attention that people value things that they might not use directly. I know there are, I've already talked to some people in the room that work for some nonprofits like World Wildlife Fund and uh, Defenders of Wildlife. You know, they send out, you've probably all got these things where they send you an envelope and worried about pandas in China or uh, hummingbirds on the border with Mexico. And they say, you know, send us $10, send us $20. You know, people do that. And uh, what are the chances they're going to ever see these pandas? So people care about these things. It's a real economic commitment. And so that's something you need to take account of. And that was the most difficult thing we did in Yellowstone, was trying to measure that passive use value. So uh, do I have any time left? <laughs> OK. Anyway, I didn't want to spend too much time setting the stage. But it's been a fight everywhere, especially in the litigation arena, uh, setting the um, uh, regulatory standards for Superfund and uh, Oil Pollution Act, the, you know, the, the industries that were being uh, managed or impacted by these uh, protect the environment kind of moves, uh, fought them, it was litigated, and you know, it's the passive use idea won out. This uh, Blue Ribbon panel was a panel of uh, Nobel laureates that Noel assembled to just take a hard look at how you estimate passive use values. We usually use something called contingent valuation. You ask people what something's worth to them, and you have to be smart about how you ask that question. Um, anyway, it's uh, made its way into policy applications, uh, managing the flows of Colorado through the Grand Canyon to protect the humpback chub, 
They used to operate that dam like a, like a toilet flush, basically. Um, at night, it'd drop down to a couple thousand CFS, and the toasters go on in Vegas, and they'd jump it up to 30,000. I, I floated it in those days, and you know, you get to do a little surfing <laughs> when you least expect it. Uh, 250 miles of white water. Anyway, uh, they made some changes based on recognizing those passive use values in the 1994 EIS. And Wolves is another example. <coughs> they get to, you figured in the state of Alaska settlement in the Exxon Valdez, <coughs> and um, we had this endorsement finally by the National Research Council. Um, anyway, so we started working on Wolves and Yellowstone and other issues. Um, I actually started working in uh, the 80s with Montana Fish and Wildlife and Parks had a new program to acquire wildlife habitat. And our conservative governor at the time, Stan Stevens, insisted that there be an economic test that had to pass. Uh, Fish and Game didn't know how to do that, so they brought me in to kind of create some methods. And one of the first ones was a proposal to buy a ranch from the Nelson family down in Livingston in the Paradise Valley north of Yellowstone. Uh, that became Dome Mountain. And to do that, I had the idea of surveying visitors in Yellowstone Park uh, to measure the value of, wolf, of elk viewing and the impact of changes in those numbers. And compared that to the, the returns to the ranching operation and showed that it made benefit cost sense to buy it and also the regional economic impacts would be positive because of the associated hunting. Um, anyway, this came, you know, get, got to get permission to talk to people in the national park. So I got to know John Varley, who was head of the natural resource program there at Yellowstone. And so we got involved in the wolf studies. And we started uh, the easy way which is uh, interviewing visitors, stand at the entrance gates, do a random sample, mail, hand out mail back. We got great cooperation. That's a nice thing about sampling in the national park. We were getting 60, 70, 80% response rates. Um, and then in 93, well, from this, we wrote a report to Congress that got Congress to sign off on doing an EIS. Um, and then, uh, then we worked on developing the EIS uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Survey of the entire country. And we'll get a little bit into that, but that was the only way we could see to really measure passive use. With uh, the Yellowstone visitor samples, we get an idea of attitude, and it was fairly broad-based because everybody goes to Yellowstone, right? I mean, you're gonna catch a sample of everybody from, from uh, Miami to uh, uh, Anchorage. Anyway, um, we had some other surveys where we got to ask a few questions, the whole bison brucellosa stuff. We also did winter use management, snowmobiles. Um, and then in 2005, we got to go back 10 years after. So I'll just jump into some results here and kind of cruise through it. Um, anyway, this is a poster that Monty Bilak did. One of the things we found was that wildlife observation was the main reason to go to the park, beats out the geysers. Uh, they have well-defined stable preferences. That means maybe you could do some economic demand modeling. Uh, and they were amazingly similar across individuals. Uh, in 2005, we sampled separately in the Lamar, which had been characterized as the American Serengeti. And this is... Uh, primary activity is uh, photographing or viewing, and it was double in the Lamar sample, kind of an example of the draw of the wolves, sort of uh, anecdotal. One of the things we asked as far as kind of human dimensions here is, uh, this was John Varley's suggestion, ask people the top three animals they'd like to see, and what percent say each animal. And uh, you know, the grizzly bear's the king here. Uh, we got the usual suite of big carnivores. Elk were up there. Even though wolves weren't present, people said, yeah. The thing that amazed me was that the poor ducks were being ignored. When I go to Glacier in the spring to bicycle go to the sun, I'm looking for harlequin ducks. That's one of my top ones. And actually, where's the wolverine? I actually saw one last spring uh, on the road eating uh, marmots. Um, anyway, what we found is these have been incredibly stable over time. After wolves were present, they jumped up into second place. 
But look how stable these are between 99 and 2005. It's kind of unbelievable how stable and knowledgeable. And these are people from, you know, Poughkeepsie, a lot of them. So people have their feelings about, about wildlife. Um, anyway, uh, there's more to be said, but this is, shows that there were a lot of support for it, big differences. Idaho and Wyoming were less than Montana. Uh, this is showing some uh, polarization. This is kind of like the, maybe the biggest uh, change in our results was, uh, oh my gosh, I'm really out of control here. <laughs> anyway, you know what, I'm gonna just stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>